is Focus with Jack Connell. Good evening, I'm Jack Cottle. Welcome to this month's edition of Focus. This month we're talking about domestic violence. Three guests with us to talk about that. Mary Corbine is the Executive Director of Working Against Violence Incorporated here in Rapid City. Mark Vargo is the Pennington County State's Attorney and Sergeant Dan Wardle is here with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office. Domestic violence is a problem everywhere you look at, regardless of income, race, ethnicity, any kind of, uh, any kind of barrier you will find domestic violence is there. One study says every one in every four women will experience domestic violence at some point in their lives. Mary, we'll start with you. How bad is the problem of domestic violence in this area? Well, I think that it, it's pretty bad. Last year, Wavy served over 2,000 victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, and that's just the people that reached out. When you say that one in four women are a victim of domestic violence in their lifetime, we know that there's so many people who haven't reached out for help yet. Now, Mark, you see the legal side of all of this. How bad from your office? How bad of a problem is this here? There are cases that come back and there are cases that escalate, and so they do become extreme problems for us. Uh, how about you, uh, Dan? How much, is, when you look at domestic violence here, how big of a problem is it in this region? It's a big enough problem that we've uh, assigned specific investigators to uh, conduct the investigations uh, so that they're specially trained to do it. Um, you know, it's definitely something that stands out. Uh, now, Mary, uh, talking about domestic violence, what exactly is it? Now, most people think of it as an actual assault from one person to another, but there's a lot of other forms to that. What exactly defines, what exactly is domestic violence? Well, domestic violence is about power and control. It's uh, systematic power and control um, of one person over another, and it can come in all forms, economic, um, uh, isolation, uh, using the children, um, and, of course, the physical violence as well. Uh, from a legal definition, Mark, what, what actually defines domestic violence from your point of view? Any time that we are dealing with two people who are either close relatives or more often are in a significant romantic relationship, that's what South Dakota defines as domestic violence. Is that just uh, boyfriend, girlfriend? Can that be brothers? Uh, how, where is that line drawn? As far as the siblings, it's drawn, or as far as the relationship, it's drawn between brothers and sisters, parents and children. Uh, grandparents and grandchildren. Beyond that, you wouldn't be included, so aunts and uncles, cousins. As far as people in a romantic relationship, if you are or have been married, or if you have a child together or are expecting a child together, uh, that counts forever. And then if you are in a significant romantic relationship is the language of statute. Uh, Dan, from the Sheriff's Office standpoint, you handle a lot of the domestic violence cases in the yes. Pennington County Sheriff's Office. How do you guys look at domestic violence? What do you guys look at domestic violence as something that you get involved with? We look at it as a, a significant uh, um, crime. Um, you know, when the violence starts, it usually escalates. And we've had a number of situations where, um, you know, it has escalated to where we've either concerned that we may end up at the level of a homicide one day, or in a couple of uh, recent cases, uh, a couple of the recent homicides have been domestic violence related. Now, virtually every couple has their moments where they have their arguments, they have their fights, but at what point does the law get involved in this? Um, you can't use physical violence against another person. So as soon as you do that, um, that constitutes assault. Um, additionally, um, I believe it was a couple of years ago, the law was, in cha or was changed to include um, strangulation in the aggravated assault uh, statute. So uh, we, we, we see a, a fair amount of incidents of strangulation uh, in the reports that we get. Now, one of the decisions your office has to make, Mark, is when to prosecute, when not to prosecute, as you look at all of these domestic violence cases that come in. Where is that line drawn? You know, like I said, every couple is going to have their moments, they're going to have their disagreements, but when do you decide that this is something that merits prosecution? Well, I think Dan uh, mentioned the level of violence or physical violence, but one of the phrases that we used earlier today was uh, intervention. Our goal ultimately is to ensure that this behavior doesn't recur. And so while we might be involved, the approach that we take to cases is going to be different uh, depending on what we think will be the best mechanism to avoid having uh, this perpetrator back and avoid having this victim uh, being re-victimized. Uh, now, Mary, you deal with the mix victims of domestic violence every day. At what point do people need to come see you? At what point does this cross the line from just a regular argument, disagreement that a couple has to 
the point where it becomes domestic violence, where they need your services. Well, people don't have to report to police to reach out to Wavy and, and receive our services. And it doesn't have to actually be a physical assault before domestic violence occurs because of that power and control. A lot of words um, can be used, too, that control behavior um, and threaten uh, threaten you without actually physically assaulting you. And a person um, knows when it's safe for them to leave. Um, they should reach out whenever, th when they're ready, when they're ready to, to um, recognize the, the violence and ready to take a step to start eliminating that from their lives. And sometimes that takes more than once. Oftentimes people receive services multiple times before they actually leave the relationship for good. How difficult is that to get somebody over that first hump to get over that fear of speaking out and say, I got to talk to somebody about this. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of that is fear too, fear of retaliation. What's going to happen if he finds out I spoke or what's going to happen? It, it'll be worse next time. Um, you know, keep it quiet uh, amongst yourself and then others wouldn't know. Um, another part of that is, um, That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, talking about kind of the struggles of, of getting people to speak out, Mark, obviously sometimes that has to be a difficulty with you, people that don't want to cooperate. They have been the victims of an assault, and they just, it's all right. I want to let it go. How do you get past that? Part of it is education, because uh, while we do see some of the dynamic of the possibility of losing the breadwinner in the family, the possibility of retaliation, one of the most insidious things that we see is that the perpetrators often convince the victims that they're at fault. We've seen this in some of the national cases here recently. And it's getting over that mindset, and that's where Wavy so much comes into play, is helping the victim understand that this is not their fault, it is the fault of the person who chose to engage in the violence. Can you move forward without the cooperation of the victim in a case like that? It's certainly more difficult, but yes, we can. We have had cases where, because of uh, other witnesses, other circumstances, uh, physical evidence, uh, the work that the care team does uh, can be absolutely crucial in that regard. To be able to build a case, even a victim is afraid to testify or chooses not to testify. Uh, Dan, I'm sure you guys have that when the deputies go out on calls, on domestic mm -hmm. violence calls, that the people that have been assaulted say nothing happened, everything's fine. How do you make that, how do you move forward with that when you have the people on scene that don't want to cooperate with you. You know, if there's evidence that an assault occurred, even with a reluctant victim, um, if, if we can establish probable cause that an assault occurred, then they're going to go ahead and make that arrest anyway. Um, additionally, we'll end up doing some follow-up uh, on the investigation level uh, and assign an investigator to do follow-up. And a lot of times they will contact a victim and, uh, you know, ask them what happened maybe after the fact, after they had a chance to think about it. Sometimes victims want to cooperate, sometimes they don't. Um, we try and put together a case regardless of whether they uh, are willing to cooperate or not. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, if it's an offender that needs prosecuting, we've done a good enough job to let the state attorney's office uh, go ahead with prosecution. Now, do you have set arrest protocols in those situations when the officers go out? On a, on a call like that? I think each call is individually assessed uh, by the responding deputies. Um, and, and again, if they feel an assault has occurred and they can show who did it, then they'll go ahead and make that arrest. Um, a lot of times we cannot determine a predominant aggressor. Uh, one person says this person did this, the other half says, no, this is what happened. And we just don't have enough evidence to uh, um, make an arrest that night. Uh, we will either see if they were willing to go their separate ways or you know, whatever. We're going to try and resolve the problem, though. All right. We'll continue our look at domestic violence with a national case that's drawn a lot of attention lately. We'll continue with that when we return with this month's edition of Focus. Welcome back to this month's edition of Focus. I'm Jack Cottle. We're talking about domestic violence and a national case involving Baltimore Ravens running back Ray Rice recently has gained a lot of national attention. A lot of people upset about that way, the way that that case was handled. But uh, Mary Corbine, the executive director of Wavy, Mary, that also started uh, a national dialogue on, on uh, domestic violence that I have not seen in a long time. What has come out of that from at least the terms of uh, attention and, and awareness of it? Well, it certainly has started a dialogue. People are talking about domestic violence. Um, it's being talked about almost every night on, on the news, which is great to bring that awareness out, to get people talking. Hopefully families will start talking about it. More people will um, not find it 
as such a subject that, that's taboo that you should be kept in the family. So hopefully this will continue a, a dialogue and awareness of domestic violence. Um, unfortunately, we shouldn't have to have a video of someone being punched mm -hmm. um, to bring this topic to the forefront and to be, have belief and bring awareness, but that's what's happened, and so we need to utilize the best part of that. Now, Janae Rice has gotten a lot of attention in this for the fact that she has stayed with him through all of that. Uh, do you see victims also sometimes getting that kind of, I don't know, notoriety, but that kind of criticism for staying with the person that assaulted them? Well, oftentimes people don't understand why a person stays in a relationship. And um, we shouldn't be asking why she's staying in the relationship. We should be asking why did he punch her. You know, asking why she stayed is, is a victim blaming statement as well. And so there's a lot of reasons why people stay. They have hope that this will be the last time that it'll change and keep the relationship going. It might be financial if I leave. Where am I going to go? How am I going to pay my bills? Um, might want to stay together for the family. So there's a lot of reasons why people do stay in these relationships. And as I mentioned before, it can take up to nine times for a person to leave a relationship before they actually leave for good. And Mark Vargo is the Pennington County State's Attorney. What do you see coming out of a dialogue like that about the Ray Rice situation? What I would really hope to see is an awareness that this can't be just a law enforcement problem and a community organization problem. It has to be a community problem as its entirety. That requires businesses, churches, community groups, all to work together because while we can have an impact on the situation, Wavy certainly has an impact on the situation. We can't solve it. Only the community as a whole can solve it. And the recognition that the employer, the NFL, whoever that might be, has a role to play in that is probably the most positive thing that I could see coming out of that. And Sergeant Dan Wardle is with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office. What do you see coming out of the talk that we've had about Ray Rice and domestic violence lately? You know, anytime that you can get a national dialogue going on, a, a problem that affects everybody locally, I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I think it really depends on how long we keep the focus on it or if the next crisis or whatever comes along and all of a sudden it goes back in, you know, the national conscious to the, the back of, you know, the room and we stop talking about it. Um, Mary's going to always be talking about it. I'm going to always be talking about it because it's what I'm responsible for in supervising. But, you know, we need beyond our organizations to continue to talk about this. Now, some statistics show that uh, kids who experience this during their childhood are twice as likely, one, to uh, abuse their spouses and children or get involved with somebody who will. How do you break that cycle? How do you get out of that loop? My answer to it is that the more that we can investigate these, these crimes that occur, refer them to the state's attorney's office. If the state's attorney's office can get involved and prosecute, then the court system can get involved, mandate some anger management, mandate whether it's, you know, alcoholism is a factor in, in what's going on, but get some counseling going on so that you've, you've got to break the adult and, and, and have them say, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to set a better example for my children. And then the children are going to grow up and, and see that. If they live in a home of violence, they're going to think that's normal and that's what they're going to do. Um, and, and so, you know, other than removing the children from every bad home, you know, in the state, uh, which, which is just literally not possible. I mean, you know, there, there are homes where violence happens and they witness it and it doesn't get reported to us, so we can't intervene. And those children are going to grow up thinking that that's okay. Um, so we've, we've got to stop it somewhere, and my belief is, is to stop it with the offender because they're the ones that are doing it. Now, Mark, you see the backgrounds of these people as they make it through the legal system. How do you stop that cycle of keeping this repeat to the next generation? Again, it comes back to the perpetrator. The only person who can really break that cycle by demonstrating a different way to do things is to have the perpetrator, to have the intervention that we're talking about, uh, the break in time, the consequences possibly of being in jail, maybe the consequence of being on probation, the assistance that we may be able to give them through probation, and then to have that perpetrator go back and be a different person, to model a different way in front of those same children is one of the ways that the cycle can be broken. Uh, alternatively, obviously, if a person can get out of that relationship and those children can again see a different relationship uh, 
uh, modeled in front of them, that's what gives us hope that we can break the cycle. Beyond that, if you just keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to get the same results. Now, Mary, you see a lot of the kids that are around this as they're growing up. How do you keep those kids from being the next generation of the domestic violence problem? Well, I think the, the best thing we can do is educate them on um, domestic violence on the signs and the effects and hope that maybe you know maybe their parents aren't going to be the one that break the cycle but maybe they can and unfortunately I've been at Wavy long enough that I've seen now kids um, that were there with their moms in the past who have come now with their own children. So how hard is it to break that? How hard is it to ingrain that that new mindset in there? Well if it's something that's been just so prevalent um, and the power and control it can take a while for people to um, realize that that person's no longer in control of their lives. You're in control of your own life and you, you make the decisions and you make the choices. Um, that can take a while for that um, thought to, to change in, in your mind. So um, it's not necessarily going to happen in one generation. Now Mark, do you see those same kind of generational tendencies coming through the courts as well? Absolutely. You recognize names, you recognize circumstances. We see kids on abuse and neglect cases and then as they transition into the juvenile system and then ultimately, sadly enough, often into the adult system. Do you see those same things out in the field with your guys? I do. Um, you know, I, I recognize a lot of the names that when I first started in law enforcement uh, a long time ago, uh, those kids are now adults and finding out that some of them are, you know, doing the same things that, uh, um, you know, that they were doing. Uh, back when they were younger, they're still doing it, and now their children are unfortunately learning out as well. So, how hard is it to stop that trend? It's probably pretty hard. I mean, you know, it's going to take a community effort. Uh, you know, we've all been talking about that all day long about uh, it not just being a law enforcement problem or not just being a wavy problem. Um, you know, we're going to do our part on it, um, but we really all need to come together and find a way to say, hey this is wrong, it has to stop, and it's not going to be accepted in our community. Um, you know, we will all continue to, to, to work and do our parts, but, but I believe that's what it's going to take. All right, we'll continue our look at domestic violence when we come back with this month's edition of Focus. And welcome back to this month's edition of Focus. I'm Jack Cottle. We're talking about domestic violence. Mark Vargo is the Pennington County State's Attorney. We talked about uh, some of the things that people see as kids that kind of lead to this. How much do drugs and alcohol play a role in this whole, whole domestic violence situation? Let me be clear, they are never the root problem. The cycle of violence and the power and control dynamic of domestic violence has to exist beforehand. That being said, they are very much triggers. They very much contribute both to the severity and the frequency with which we see overt acts of domestic violence within a relationship that is at least susceptible to it. So they definitely make the problem worse. Now, most times when people think of domestic violence, they're thinking of men assaulting women. Are men the victims very often? And does the law make any distinction about the gender of the victim in a case? Absolutely not. Uh, men are, in fact, victims. Uh, statistically, probably far less so. The, the power and control cycle uh, as a culture that is far less likely for a woman over a man. Certainly in same-sex couples, we will see uh, domestic violence though and we will see domestic violence with women as perpetrators against men just not quite as many and uh, Dan Wardle sergeant with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office uh, do you see many cases where men are the men are the victims in domestic violence as a ratio goes women are more likely to be the victim however we do have a I would say a number of instances in, in our job is to go out and investigate these whether on the patrol level or an investigation is to determine a predominant aggressor and sometimes that can, in fact, be the uh, woman in the relationship. And we will, if prob uh, probable cause exists, we'll arrest the person that is the predominant aggressor. So, um, but, but like I said, the majority of, of times it, it is a man against a woman. Um, but, but there are occasions where it's otherwise. Uh, Mary Corbine is the executive director of Wavy here in Rapid City. Uh, Mary, do you, I mainly people think of Wavy as for women. Do you 
have services for men who are the victims of domestic violence. We do. We provide the exact same services to men that we would for women, with the one exception that the men wouldn't be able to stay in our physical shelter. We would have to help find another safe place for them to go, but otherwise we would provide all the same services. Now looking at uh, any victim of domestic violence, what services do you provide? What, what can you do for someone if they come to you? after they've had problems? Well, a lot of us think of us, uh, a lot of people think of us as the um, shelter. And so we do provide emergency safe shelter to about 600 women and children a year. We help people through court advocacy. So we might help them with a protection order, um, sit with them through court, through an investigation. Um, we have support groups. We provide a lot of emotional support for people. Um, you know, some financial, uh, emergency financial support when we can. Um, and we also have some other financial support through maybe if someone needs help with food or necessity items. And we rely on donations from the community for us to be able to give those out to people. So um, we do a lot. Last year we provided over 32,000 services in total. Uh, now, Mark, what kind of services does your office have to help guide people through this process? Obviously a very difficult process for them sometimes. What do you guys do to make that easier? One of the things that we have for domestic violence cases uniquely is a victim's advocate. We have a gentleman in my office whose only responsibility is to work with the victims of domestic violence, to let them understand what the process is, and to help them as they work through the, the system. I also have a designated domestic violence prosecutor uh, who handles all of these cases, uh, sometimes in concert with some of the other attorneys. but. We do have somebody who is specially trained and devoted to these cases who then gets a better understanding of the dynamic and the way these cases progress through the system. Now, Dan, you've talked a couple of times about the care team down yes. at the uh, sheriff's office. Tell me about, about, uh, tell me about that. What uh, does the care team do? The, the, the care team and care stands for Coordinated Action Response uh, Enhancement and Enforcement. And uh, we have a, a group of agencies, and, and our agency provides two investigators to that a deputy that is responsible for serving TPOs or protection orders um, and uh, Wavy, we contract with them for a case manager that works out of our office who I refer every report to, uh, to them for their assessment on providing victim services. We also have patrol deputies that are specifically trained in domestic violence cases that if they're available they will respond and they do checks on some of our, our victims that need some extra checking on because of the, the offenders just won't leave them alone. So we do extra checks on, on some of them as well. Um, we work in, in, I mentioned this earlier today, that uh, there's also representation on the team from the state's attorney's office, from uh, uh, Department of Social Services, uh, the uh, Child Advocacy Center, and court services as well. So we are coming together as a community to try and, and do what we can to uh, um, help our victims as much as possible. And, and I believe if we help our victims, that's the number one thing we're trying to do. And then secondary to that is we're trying to hold the offenders accountable. Uh, Mary, this is a fight that goes on and on. Do you feel like you're making progress? I do. Every time someone comes to our door or calls on our phone, we're making progress because another person reached out for help. And so um, we have to look at our successes in different ways, but I believe every person that we are, are able to help is a success. Now, if they need to call you guys, what's the number? 341-4808. And I'm sure that's 24 hours 24 a day. Hours Give a them day. a ring and uh, help you out. All right, yes. I want to thank you guys all for coming up. Mary Corbine, Mark Fargo, and Sergeant Dan Wardle, thank you. And uh, best of luck in the fight against domestic violence, and hopefully we will finally win that one. That will do it for us. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again the first Sunday night of next month. Good night.